So we're going to read the 8th Psalm. So as you're turning to the 8th Psalm, there's some amazing truths that we're going to see in this Psalm today that are really particularly uh, relevant to our Bible study today. And we're going to see in this beautiful Psalm that the true and the living God, which we serve, God is an amazing God. He's an amazing God because He's majestic and He's sovereign and He's the creator over all things, which includes us. So look at Psalm 8, or the 8th Psalm. Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, you who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established strength because of your enemies to do away with the enemy and the revengeful. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you think of him? And a son of man that you are concerned about him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You have him rule over the works of your hands. You have put everything under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the animals of the field, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful morning that we have the opportunity and the privilege to study your word, to learn more about you and the way that you created us and the way that you made us. And we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in church together. We thank you so much for all the wonderful pastors who teach us from your word day in and day out. Please bless them wherever they're at. In their ministries, Lord, please just fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your presence and help them to clearly and accurately preach your word, Lord. We think of Pastor John in Spain. We think of Pastor Joel in Canada. We think of Pastor Jason in Irvine. We think of Pastor Kevin who's preaching to us here today, Lord. We just ask that you just bless them all. Lord, we also ask that you just bless the Sunday school. Help us to learn more, to be more conformed into the image of Christ, Lord, through the understanding of this word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, on my commute... To and from work, I pass by a series of billboards. You probably see the same billboards on your commute to and from work, right? Some are interesting, some of them are not so interesting, but there's actually a set of billboards that's put out by a Christian university, a well-known Christian university. Maybe you've seen them. They're on the 91, on the 215 freeway, on the 10 freeway. It's kind of how we talk in Southern California, right? Freeways. So on the 91, on the 215, on the 10, maybe they're in other places too. I don't know. I haven't seen them there. But it's a white billboard, and in beautiful black cursive letters, three words. Live your purpose. Have you seen it? Live your purpose. Well, if you're commuting early in the morning and you're still sipping on your first cup of coffee and maybe you're sitting stuck in traffic or maybe the opposite, you're speeding, trying to make it to work on time, that phrase, live your purpose, hits you pretty hard, doesn't it? It's going to make you stop and think. And I mean, it's a pretty heavy command. Live your purpose. Because the first question that should come to your mind is what? Oh, what is my purpose? Oh, what am I doing? And is it my job since I'm going to work? Is it my job? Is my job my purpose? I mean, no matter what you do and however helpful it is to humanity and however beneficial it is, is that your main purpose? And many people would say yes. Many people in our society would say yes. Is it your family? Is my purpose making money and paying taxes and paying the bills? Or is my purpose accumulating wealth? Or is my purpose going up the corporate ladder? Or is my purpose becoming famous? Maybe having name recognition. For some people, their purpose is to become a good athlete. You see the Olympics right now, right, that are happening. Maybe have an online presence on Instagram or Twitter and have many people following you. What about a societal level? Because you see, in the absence of God, human society always creates a purpose for people. It's always the wrong purpose, but they have a purpose, don't they? Think of communism, which was so prevalent in so many countries. and It's now making a comeback. And communism did what? It eliminates God and looks at man as having the sole purpose of being an economic being, a worker to build up society? What about Freud and psychology, which eliminates God and sees man primarily as a sexual being? 
or postmodernism, which eliminates God and says that man is a product of the social influence of people that are around him. All of it, wrong. Live your purpose. Wonderful command. What is my purpose? Am I living my purpose? You see, in some ways, David had these same questions here in the 8th Psalm. Because against God's magnificence, against the beauty of creation, against the backdrops of the heavens which declare the glory of God, man seems small and man seems very insignificant, doesn't he? And that's what David contemplates here in the fourth verse. What is man? What is man? And you see, the answer to that question is found only in the Bible. It's only found in God's Word. And the Bible teaches us very clearly that man, that you, that you are a direct creation of a very personal, all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves, right? Psalm 100, verse 3. God is the one who designed you, and God is the one that made you, and He made you with dignity. He made you with a purpose, and He made you in His image. Because even though, when we look at the rest of creation, and the rest of creation reminds us of God's amazing power, and at the same time it reminds us of our smallness to make us feel kind of insignificant, at the same time we're reminded in this psalm that we are the crowning glory of God's creation. We are the crowning glory of what God made and what God created. And do you know why? Because you're made in God's own image. And that's the first part, actually, of the book of Genesis. There's multiple verses there you'll see on your notes. Do you know what this means? This means you don't live in a vacuum. This means you don't live on your own in this world. But rather, the starting point of everything in your life is God. God is the starting point. He made the world and everything in it. Acts 17, 24. In Him, we live, we move, we have our being. Acts 17, 28. And this is absolutely crucial to understand. Because the only reason that we exist is because God exists. And because God made us. And because God created us in His image. Now we know about images, don't we? We know a lot about images in our day and age in our culture. Images are everywhere. And what does an image represent? An image represents a copy, or it represents a representation, I guess. An image is also complemented by the word likeness here, which is kind of like a pattern, or it's a shape, or it's a form. In other words, we are copied and patterned after God, Genesis 1.26, in the same way that Seth was copied or patterned after his father Adam in Genesis 5.3. And when we look at God's image in man, to comprehend it, we really have to understand several things. First, we have to understand that the image of God was best seen in Adam before the fall, right? Before he sinned in the Garden of Eden. Because God's image in man has been almost blotted out. It remains, it's still there, but in a very confused, ruinous state because of what sin has done to people and what sin has done to man. Second, the image of God is actually now made manifest best, guess in who? In Christians. It's in Christians who've been reborn, been born again, if you will, through faith in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that image will receive its full splendor when? At glorification, right? When you're transferred to glory when you're resurrected. Third, the best way to understand the image of God in man is to look to who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, who is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15. Jesus made God's image visible, and God is calling sinners to be saved and to become now conformed to the image of his Son, right? Right? Romans 8, 29. And when somebody becomes saved, what happens? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new man. He's a new man that's renewed according to the image of his creator, Colossians 3, 10. Renewed in knowledge. Renewed in righteousness. Renewed in holiness. Renewed, basically, in a whole new way of life. A whole new way of life that was completely different from before he was saved before he became a new man. 
a new man who has been created according to God, Ephesians 4.24. And after a person is saved through faith in Jesus Christ, God does what? God works through the Holy Spirit in that person to do what? To transform him more and more and more into the image of his son. And and God transforms that Christian believer from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians 3.18. So again, man, made originally in God's image, stumbles, falls, sins, and that image becomes corrupted, defiled by sin, scarcely recognizable. But now for believers, restored again into visibly bearing God's image. Dear Christian believer, you actually to the world represent God's image. And you know what? That's just amazing. That is just amazing because you are showing the world around you kind of what God looks like and what a redeemed Christian should look like. And how did God make man? How did God create us? This is kind of, kind of this is going to get to the essence, to the nuts and bolts of our lesson today. But how did God make us? God made us with a body and with a soul. And the body is referred to as a house of clay in Job 4.19, right? But what does that mean? What does a house of clay mean? It means it's mortal. It means it's finite. It means it's aging. None of us like aging, do we? It has a shelf life, if you will. Maybe an expiration date. Everybody looks on expiration dates on their medications. So we cannot boast of our own excellence. We're frail, mortal, houses of clay, finite. And God designed to give life to these earthen clay vessels, our bodies. And how do you give them life? God willed your house of clay to be the house of an immortal spirit. Interesting. And when it comes to your immortal soul, please think about the things which demonstrate your immortal essence. Even though you're a mortal being or you live in a mortal body, you have an immortal soul. Think about it. You're aware of time. You think about eternity even though you're mortal. You reason and you reflect about things that aren't even present around you. You choose by judgment the better of presented alternatives. Well, hopefully you do. I know some people who always just make the bad choice, it seems like, in their life. I right? always have a black cloud. Hopefully you make the better choice by judgment. You think upon what you see and you control your Impulses, your bodily impulses by reasoning, by thought, by reflecting. Because your soul ultimately understands that there are things that are hidden from your bodily senses. Think of the uniqueness of you. Think of when you're lying on your bed at night and you sometimes contemplate what's in the heavens, right? Or think about when you sleep and you dream. What do you dream about? Maybe traveling to other places and taking up new hobbies, or having new pursuits, and you imagine people that you've never, ever met before. Right? These are all things that are happening in your soul, in your spirit, the immaterial parts of you. And God provided your soul with the ability to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, to understand what is just, to understand what is honorable. And God has given us reason as a guide in order for us to be able to distinguish what we're supposed to follow and what we're supposed to avoid. And again, in the pre-fall state of man, this reason, this understanding, this judgment, this uprightness, this soundness of mind, all of it excelled. It was great. It worked very well. But in the current, corrupted, fallen, sinful state that we find ourselves in, they're all tarnished and tainted. Now, even though the soul and the spirit is immortal, it needs to be cleansed from defilement, 2 Corinthians 7.1. It needs to be shepherded by Jesus, 1 Peter 2.25, because it is subject to be attacked. It's attacked by wicked lusts which wage war against your soul, 1 Peter 2.11. That's why pastors are called to stand watch and to render account for the souls that are entrusted to their care, Hebrews 13.17. And because of sin... And because of these wicked lusts that wage war against your soul, guess what? The soul is liable for punishment, 2 Corinthians 1.23. And it can actually be sent to eternal fire, Matthew 10.28. Ultimately, the soul, it's subject to God the Father, Hebrews 12.9, because upon death the spirit returns to God 
Ecclesiastes 12, 7. And after death, depending on how that person's sin has been treated, what has been paid for at the cross by Jesus Christ, through faith, the soul either enjoys bliss in Abraham's bosom, which we refer to as heaven, like Lazarus, or is sentenced to eternal torment in hell, like the rich man in Luke 16, 22. Ultimately, for believers, the important part to realize is that the soul enjoys God's presence, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. Well, let's look at the composition of man a little bit more in depth. This becomes a little bit academic, but I, think, I still think it's very important for us to understand it, right? Because we want to understand all of God's word, and we want to understand exactly how God made us. So let's look a little bit more at this in depth. And I've been very careful so far to use the term soul and spirit interchangeably, or to use them together, soul, spirit. But this brings up a very good question. Maybe you've heard about this before, but is man two parts or is man three parts? In other words, is man a body and a soul or is man a body and a soul and a spirit? Three parts. Now, essentially, there's three views on this subject. And the three views are monism, trichotomy, and dichotomy. And the first one's monism. And I, I just want to deal with this one first to kind of get it out of the way. Because no legitimate Christian groups hold this view. In fact, this view is almost universally rejected. And I remember in school many, many years ago, not in seminary, but I remember having acquaintances that held this errant and unbiblical view. And I remember being shocked when they told me this because it just kind of threw me off. It didn't seem right. Because monism holds that there's no separate existence between the body and the soul. You're one being. Body and soul are together. So when the body dies, monism maintains that there's no separate existence for the soul. That means that the soul dies too. But it allows for a future resurrection, in which case you would refer to it as soul sleep. The soul is sleeping while awaiting the future resurrection. Again, this is rejected by almost all Christians because it goes against the teachings of the Bible. There's multiple verses there in your handout which show that there is a separate soul and spirit that continues to live on even after the body dies. Now, there's two other views that are held by evangelical Christians, and actually all Christians, which is trichotomy and dichotomy. And we're going to look at both of these in depth this morning. But let's start with trichotomy, because trichotomy is actually a very common view among Christians. Maybe you're a trichotomist too, or maybe you used to be one, or maybe you know people who are. In fact, this week I was speaking with a solid, God-loving, biblical pastor, and I told him what the subject of today's Sunday School was, and as I told him, he immediately started supporting trichotomy, almost instantly. So it's very, very common, very popular view, but, but, but when looking at the biblical evidence, which we're going to look at, there isn't the greatest of support for trichotomy. In fact, there's much more support for dichotomy. We're going to look at that. So what is trichotomy? Trichotomy, already figured out. Tri, like a triangle, three sides to a triangle, three parts to man. So basically, trichotomy has the idea that man is a three-part being. Body and soul and spirit. Three different parts. And trichotomists agree, in fact, all Christians agree, that all people have a soul. And man's soul includes his intellect, his emotions, his will, his rational thought, who you are on the inside. And a man's soul has the freedom and the ability, under the guidance of rational thought, to make two choices, to yield and to live in sin or to serve God. So apart from that, there's no disputing. Everybody agrees that every, that every man has a soul. But the difference is that, type, that, the, that the trichotomist sorry, also believe that in addition to the body and the soul, man has a separate third part, a spirit. So that the man is body and soul and spirit. And they say that the spirit is actually a higher faculty in man that becomes alive when the person becomes a Christian. And they base this on Romans 8.10. If Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. So the spirit of the person, in the view of the trichotomist, would be the part that's been made alive at salvation. That then is able to worship God, that then is able to pray to God, that was previously dead in trespasses and sins, now made alive through faith in Jesus Christ by the drawing of the Father and the working of the Holy Spirit, and that person's spirit is now alive because they're a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
Other verses that they, that they use to support this view is John 4, 24. Remember this. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And then Philippians 3, 3. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and take pride in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. There's also the other view. We're going to talk a little bit more about trichotomy later. But there's also the other view, which is dichotomy. And this one is more historically held among evangelical scholars and is more commonly held overall than trichotomy. But di, di stands for two. Dichotomists maintain that a man is made up of a body and a soul. And when it comes to the word spirit, dichotomists maintain that spirit is just another interchangeable term for soul. Basically, they're saying the same thing. They're synonyms. They're the same word, but they're just used interchangeably. In other words, both soul and spirit can be used interchangeably when talking about the immaterial, the immortal part of man. For example, in John 12, 27, Jesus says what? Now my soul is troubled, right? And a few verses later in 13, 21, it says that Jesus was troubled in spirit. Interchangeable use. Mary in what's commonly known as the Magnificat, right? And Luke chapter 1 says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Remember that? Back from uh, Christmas not too long ago. Now this, here what Mary is doing, my soul and spirit, it's called Hebrew parallelism. It's basically a poetic device where the same idea is repeated, but using synonymous words. So you're not using the same word over and over again, you're just using another word that means the same thing. So in other words, soul and spirit are basically synonyms that can be used interchangeably, but do not refer to a different parts of a man. You're not a three-person being. In fact, with the Bible refers to either a soul or the spirit departing when a person dies, but never to both. For example, Revelation 6, 9 says, the souls of those slain for the word of God. It doesn't say the souls and the spirits for those who are slain for the word of God. Of Rachel, remember in Genesis it says that as her soul was departing. And Isaiah 53, 12, which talks about the coming servant, the coming Messiah, Jesus. Isaiah says that the Lord would pour out his soul to death. In Luke 12, 20, Jesus says that in the parable of the rich fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. Interestingly, Jesus, on the other hand, says at the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, in response to these passages, the trichotomists might argue that they're talking about different things. But again, nowhere does Scripture use both terms when talking about a person dying. It's never the soul and the spirit departed. It's never the soul and the spirit went to heaven. It's never the soul and the spirit were yielded to God. Almost, it almost seems like the authors don't specifically care. Obviously, they do specifically care because every term is important. But it's almost like these terms are used interchangeably whenever they're used in Scripture. Now look at this. Please turn with me if you have your Bibles with you this morning. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. This is actually a very, very interesting passage here. Because this is Jesus talking here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 here. And what does he say? You probably all remember this from Sunday school when we were younger. Matthew 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Now, Jesus here is obviously using the word body and soul to refer to the entire person. He doesn't mention spirit as a third and separate part of the person. Now, from there, turn briefly just a little bit over to 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, just a few pages over. It's not quite a few pages, but you get the idea. It's not too far away. 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Look at this. Look what the Apostle Paul says here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 5.5 5. I have decided to turn such a person over to Satan for the destruction of his body so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Look at the terminology here. The destruction of the body, the physical, material part of the person. Why? So that his spirit, immaterial, immortal part of the person, may be saved. Did Paul forget the soul? Paul, you left out the soul. Did he forget it? No. No, he didn't. 
Rather, he uses spirit to refer to the immortal, immaterial part of man, just like soul. These terms are completely interchangeable. They're not separate parts of a person. James 2.26, the body, apart from the spirit, is dead, but no mention of a separate soul. One last indirect support of dichotomy versus trichotomy is the fact that the spirit, just like the soul, can be defiled by sin and is subject to sin. Remember we talked about the fact that people maintain that the spirit is separated, right? Comes alive at the time of salvation, is able to worship and to fellowship with God and is able to pray to God. But remember that the rebellious people of Israel in Psalm 78, 8, what do they have? They had a spirit that was not faithful to God. It doesn't say a soul that intentionally and willfully chose to sin, although it could say that. But it says a spirit that is not faithful. Also remember that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. There's a couple more verses there in your handout that show the same thing. Now all of this is only to say that scripture clearly shows us that if the spirit is separate, which it certainly does not appear to be, that the spirit is not the spiritually pure part of our Christian lives that is in close relationship with worshiping God like the trichotomists maintain. But the spirit, just like the soul, can have sinful desires and sinful pursuits. Now, not, by contrast, not only can the spirit have sinful desires, but look at this. The soul in the Bible is described as blessing and praising God. Psalm 103.1, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, Psalm 146. So to summarize everything that we've seen so far, there's no distinction that's made between the spirit and the soul in the Bible when it comes to the immaterial parts of man. Both terms are used of the immaterial, immortal side of people without any real distinction between the terms. Now finally, we have to be careful to not imply that only the immaterial side of our personhood, our soul spirits, worships God, because we actually worship God with our whole being, with our material bodies and our immortal soul spirit. In fact, we're going to do it shortly, aren't we? In about half an hour, we're going to go into church, and what's the first thing that we're going to do? We're going to sing. And then some people are going to clap their hands. Some people may even raise their hands. And then there's going to be people up front that are going to use instruments. And how are they going to use those instruments? They're going to use their hands, or maybe they're going to use their feet. What are they doing? What are we doing? We're worshiping God with our whole being, with our body and our soul spirit, using our voices, using our hands, using our feet, using our bodies to give God the glory. All of us, our entire being, exists to praise and to worship God. Now, maybe you grew up trichotomous, and maybe your favorite preacher is trichotomous, and you know my goal isn't necessarily to convert you or to change your opinion today, but you might be thinking, hey, 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 hold on, not so fast, not so fast, slow it down here. What about 1 Thessalonians 5.23? 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Look at this verse here. If you have your Bible and you're you're close by, I encourage you to turn there. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, all of you, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, clearly this verse speaks about three different parts of man, doesn't it? Well, not really. Because it's just like Jesus, when Jesus says in Matthew 22, 37, you shall love the the Lord your God with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Does that mean that the soul is different from the mind and the heart? Are they just interchangeable terms for the inner part of your being? In other words, the Apostle Paul here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 isn't saying that the, whole, that the spirit and the soul are different entities, but rather he's saying that it is the immaterial part of the man, not the body, and that God needs to sanctify us wholly, all of us in our entirety, our body and our soul spirit. Why? So that we can be blameless at the coming of the Lord. Now, there's another verse. What about Hebrews 4.12? And this one actually came to my mind before really studying this passage. And maybe you thought of this one too. As well, maybe you learned this verse in Awana. And see, we have some of our Awana instructors here. Maybe you learned this verse in Sunday school. So, all right, dear Awana graduates, remember Hebrews 4.12? The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And what does it do? Pierces to the division of soul and spirit, 
of joints and marrow in discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now this verse seems to be making a clear division between soul and spirit, isn't it? Well, not really. Because the author of Hebrews here is using the same language that the Apostle Paul used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we just looked at. So basically, he's using several terms that speak of the deep inward parts of our being, which are not removed from the penetrating effect of God's Word. God's Word illumines and exposes what is happening deep within us. The soul is pierced by the Bible. The Bible divides it. Divides it. And so it does the Spirit as well. Because the Bible discovers the innermost intentions of our heart and it brings God's light on them. It exposes them. It shows them so we can understand what we need redemption from and what we need transforming and cleansing of within. So the point here is that God's word exposes everything that's hidden in our innermost beings and it uses the word soul and spirit as synonyms for our innermost being. Now finally, many trichotomists also make the argument from personal experience. And personal experience is a bit of a dangerous thing to make an argument from, but we tend to do it all the time on certain things. And they say that they have a unique spiritual awareness of God's presence. And they have a unique awareness of God's presence, which to them is different, or I guess maybe to all of us, is different from our ordinary thoughts and emotions, right? We're worshiping God, we're praising Him, we're praying, we're studying in prayer, we're in, we're in fellowship with God. And while it's true that we worship God in prayer, we do so with our inner man for which, again, soul and spirit can be used interchangeably. In other words, the human spirit is not something that is dead in unbelievers that then comes alive when a person becomes a Christian because unbelievers also have a spirit that is alive. But it's alive in rebellion towards God, like Nebuchadnezzar, right? It says in Daniel 5.20. Or, like we mentioned earlier, the unfaithful people of Israel in Psalm 78, verse 8. Remember that you were saved, and before you were saved, what were you? Ephesians says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And that deadness, that deadness related to you as a whole person, not just a dead spirit. And now that you're saved, now that you're regenerated, now that you've been graciously redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ, the opposite happens. You are now dead to sin, but alive to God. Romans 6.11 we mentioned it earlier, but if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not just a new spirit, a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 So ultimately, the most correct way to view man is as an overall unity. Material and immaterial. Mortal and immortal. Body and soul spirit. Now, speaking about the soul, as we look at the unity of man, the question becomes, how does your soul come about? Where did your soul come from? How did your soul wind up in your body? And there's ultimately three views on this that we're going to speak about briefly here. But the first is creationism. And that's just clear cut. God creates a new soul for each person. And God sends it into the body at some point between conception and the time that the baby is born. There's a second view called traducianism. And that holds that the soul, as well as the body of the child, are derived from the parents at the time of conception. And the last view is pre-existentialism, that the souls of people exist in heaven long before their bodies are made and long before they're conceived in the wombs of their mothers. Then in the womb, God brings that pre-existent soul into the body to be joined with the body in the womb. Now this view is not held by any kinds of Christian, remote Christian groups whatsoever because it's more common with Middle Eastern or Eastern thought, Eastern religious thought, like reincarnation. So no Christian groups hold to the pre-existentialism. But both creationism and uh, tra uh, traducianism have extensive supporters in the Christian community. Creationism is actually the prevalent view of the Roman Catholic Church, and it was also held by John Calvin, uh, whereas uh, traducianism was favored more by Luther, the Lutherans, and American theologians like Jonathan Edwards and many theologians today. Let's talk about creationism first which again is the idea that God creates a new soul for each person and sends it into the body between conception and birth. And is there biblical support for this? And the creationists would say yes. Psalm 127, verse 3, which says that sons are a heritage from where? From the Lord. And the idea of this verse is that not only the soul, or not only the body of the child, but 
The entire person, the entire person of the child, including the soul, is a gift from the Lord. I remember, for those of, uh, for those of us who are pro-life, which should be all of us, uh, David states that the Lord knit him together, where? <coughs> His mother's womb. We use that verse all the time. I'm against abortion. Why? Because the Lord knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm a child of God. I'm a creation of God. Now this verse can also be used to support creationism because what does it show? It shows that God is actively involved in forming people in their mother's womb. Then Isaiah 42, 5, it says that God gives breath to the people of the earth and spirit to those who walk in it. And finally, Hebrews 12, 9 says that God is the father of spirits. Now these passages would all suggest that God is the one who creates our spirits or souls. What about traditionism? Remember that traditionism is the uh, idea that the soul, as well as the body of the child, are inherited from the baby's mother and father at the time of conception. And the idea here is that God often acts through secondary means, or secondary causes, if you will, to bring about his desired results. And he does so through the actions of human beings. So apart from the physical connection of a mother and a father, no child would be conceived or born. So in other words, God carries out his creative process through human procreation. But then the question becomes, how much or whether or what, to what degree does God involve the human parents in the process of the creation of the soul and the body? And we simply do not know. What is the main support for traditionism? And it comes really from Genesis 1.27, which we mentioned earlier, that God created man in his own image. And likeness to God is the ability to create. And the ability to create that humans have is the ability to create other humans like ourselves. Remember that God had, that God had said at the point of creation that the plants and the animals were to bear descendants according to their own kind, right? So Adam and Eve were able to bear children with a spiritual nature like theirs and not just a physical body. And this would imply that the souls of Adam and Eve's children were derived from Adam and Eve. Now the Bible also talks about descendants being present in the body of someone in previous generations. Remember this? In Hebrews uh, 7, 10 it says that Melchizedek met Abraham. When? When Levi was still in the loins of of his ancestor. Now this could also be taken in a figurative sense and not necessarily a literal sense. So there is that too. And then all of us personally have seen what? We've seen that children oftentimes imitate their parents. Haven't we? Both their good traits and their bad traits. They're not so good traits. The question is, are they, for those of you involved in children's ministry, you know this to be true. Uh, and Not really. All the kids here are wonderful. Uh, they really are. Now, the question is, do they see those bad traits from their parents or other kids at school or from television or whatever? Or are they imitating those traits because they've witnessed those and seen those? Or are those inherently hereditary? Well, that's a tough question. And you can really, or is it both? So that's a really tough question. You know, most of the time it's, it's environmental influence too. So how much of it is genetic influence? So maybe there's both to it. Anyway, but it's clear that God is actively involved in the creation of each human soul, right? But there is good evidence to suggest that he may do so through the secondary cause of deriving the soul of the children from the parents themselves. Now, remember that Christian University billboard I was telling you about at the beginning? Remember driving on the freeway in the morning and seeing those billboards? And it says, live your purpose. I didn't tell you that there's a second matching pair that the same university has out. Maybe you've seen it too, but it looks almost identical to the first one. One set of billboards says, live your purpose. Beautiful, thought-provoking. Well, they seem to answer the question of what they think your purpose is with the second one. You know what the second one says? Three words, three different words. Live for others. Live your purpose, live for others. In other words, they feel, at least the people who promoted the billboards of the advertising campaign, spent a lot of money on it too, I'm sure. They feel that you to live your purpose means to live for others. Now, on the surface, it sounds nice. It sounds charitable. It sounds altruistic and pretty kind. I mean, in many ways, it's selflessly communal in a 
Very selfish society that's isolated and individualized. Live for others. Hmm. But is that true? Is that true? Because living your purpose, in their mind, is living for others. But the truth is that despite their noble intentions and despite the feel-good vibe of that billboard and the fact that it's a catchy advertisement for their university, the truth is that they're in marked error. They are wrong, especially for a Christian university. Now, at a minimum, I wish they would have said, live your purpose, live for Christ. Live your purpose, live for the gospel. Live your purpose, live for the kingdom of God. But they didn't. And dear brothers and sisters, you already know the answer from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. But what is the chief end of mankind? What do you... How do you live your purpose? What is your main purpose for living? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. You know what your purpose is? Live your purpose. Here's the ultimate billboard. Live your purpose. Live for God's glory. And I wish whoever spent those big bucks on the freeways would have put that out there. Live your purpose. Live for God's glory. Glorify God. Glorify God in your life right now that you live. Your immortal soul in your mortal body, because both are called to glorify God. And there's a lot of verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. 1 Peter 4, 11, that God in all things may be glorified. 1 Chronicles 26, 29, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, here's one, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Philippians 1, 20, Christ shall be magnified in my body, in the life that we live now. We must bring glory to God, to the Father who gave us life, to the Son who gave his life for us, and to the Spirit who produces new life in us. Glorifying God consists really of four things. Appreciation, adoration, affection, and subjection. We'll talk about it a little bit more practically down below, but Appreciation is setting him highest in our thoughts, like Psalm 92, 8. Thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. Thou art exalted far above all gods, Psalm 97. We also are, are, are glorifying God when we admire him, when we esteem him as most excellent, when we admire his attributes, when we admire his promises, when we admire his power and his wisdom in making the world, and his power in sustaining the world, and sustaining our lives. What about adoration? We're called to praise him. Psalm 29, 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Affection, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Another well-known verse. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with thy soul. Subjection, dedicating ourselves for God, being ready to serve him as our heart studies for him, our tongues speak on his behalf, our hands work for him. How can we glorify God practically? Think about this. There's a lot of answers here. We glorify God when we prefer him above all other things. Houses and lands and money and wealth, relationships, family. And when God's glory comes in competition with all those things, we prefer God's glory. We're content that God's will should take place, even if it goes against our own desires. We're content to lose or content to win. Content with our belongings, content with our job, content with our spouse, content with our children, praying, praying for needs, boldly coming before the throne, but trusting in God's sovereignty and goodness. You know how else we glorify God? We glorify God when Christ is preached. We also glorify God by confessing our sin. Remember what Joshua tells Achan? Give glory to God. Confess your sin. Confess your sin, Joshua 7, 19. You know, also we glorify God? We glorify God by believing his word, by believing his promises, by believing his goodness towards us, Romans 4, 20. We also glorify God by desiring his name to be honored, Psalm 49, 9, being zealous for his name. What does it do to you when you're on about and you hear somebody taking the Lord's name in vain. Or you're watching a television program, and you hear, makes you cringe, kind of freezes up. 
Ooh, I don't like that. That's not good. That dishonors my Lord. It bothers me. Why? Be zealous. Zealous for the Lord's name, John 2, 14. Also glorify God by being fruitful. Jesus says, Hereby my Father is honored that you bear much fruit, in John 15, 18. Finally, we glorify God by standing, it's not finally, we have a couple more, but we glorify God also by standing up for his truth. Jude 3 tells us to contend earnestly for the faith. Fight. Contend. Stand up for him. Now else we glorify God? We glorify God by praising him. Psalm 50, verse 23. His praise exalts him in the sight of others. We spread his fame. We spread his renown. We describe his excellencies. And we think about it. We are the temple as redeemed believers. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16. The temple of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? Praising God is one of the highest and purest aspects of our Christian faith. Finally, we glorify God by being cheerful. We're always morose. <sighs> Down and out. Beaten up. Low energy. Oh, just struggling through life. How does that reflect your Lord? How does that reflect your master? Does it make him look bad? It makes him look bad. I had a friend. How are you doing today? Praise the Lord, brother. I'm great. Lord is so good to me. Lord takes care of me and provides for me. I'm just so thankful I'm a Christian. Wow. What an example. If we consider what Christ has done for us by his shed blood, what he does in us through his spirit, you know what it's going to do? It's going to lead to great cheerfulness. Have a cheerful heart. Cheerful countenance. Have a smile on our faces wherever we go. And that cheerfulness glorifies God. In fact, we're, to, we're, we're told in Psalm 100, verse 2, to do what? To serve the Lord with gladness. Gladness. Beautiful. You're serving Him, glorifies Him most when it's done with gladness. Be happy. Be cheerful. We glorify God in all that we do. Same verse we had at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, whether you drink, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Don't be deceitful. Don't practice deceit in your workplace. Speak the truth in those mom groups without slander or gossip. Strive like Paul to have a conscience without offense towards God and man. Live a holy life. You are a holy nation. You're called to show the praises of him that called you, 1 Peter 2.19. And finally, we glorify God by evangelizing the lost and drawing others to God, Galatians 4.19. The second part of that was to enjoy him in this life and also forever. That refers to both your body and the soul, your current body as well as your resurrection body, together with your immortal soul. The joy he gives is eternal. It's a crown that does not fade away. And guess what? It's reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 5, 4. Amen? Amen. Let's finish with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity we had this morning to study your word, to understand the way you created us, to understand that you made us in your image. And we're just so humbled by that. And we're so appreciative. And we're so thankful that you constantly display your goodness in our lives. Help us to glorify you, Lord, this week and every day of our lives in everything that we say, in everything, in everything that we do, in everything that we think, may it be reflected towards pointing people towards you so that you would be glorified in our lives. And Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your precious Son, who died on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Any questions? Praise the Lord.